Hi, uh, you're watching lecture number five of uh, the Introduction to Photonics video series. Today we are going to talk about uh, the optical components. So we are slowly moving in the direction of doing practical stuff. So the concepts and uh, the subject that is going to be introduced today is going to play an important role uh, in uh, your uh, hands-on part of this uh, course that you're going to take at the end of it. So again, the lecture number five we are going to introduce the optical components. So specifically, uh, we are going to talk about the thermal, mechanical, and chemical properties of optical materials in addition to their uh, primary uh, optical characteristics. So we talked a little bit about optical materials last time. Uh, we uh, explained and uh, expanded on the topic of index of refraction. Uh, today we're going to also, as I said, look at uh, some other non-optical properties that are playing an important role in the selection of, selection of optical uh, materials such as thermal, mechanical, and chemical prop properties. We're also going to look at uh, different optical materials and we'll see how we can uh, uh, choose a specific type of optical material for a specific use uh, in uh, different types of uh, uh, spectral regions such as visible ultraviolet and infrared region. And finally, uh, we are going to uh, shift our attention at the end to uh, different types of uh, coatings and filters. Uh, we'll see that uh, very often coatings are being uh, placed on a transparent uh, uh, material uh, for different uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, we're going to explain different uh, processes to achieve that. And uh, finally, we're going to talk about uh, different types of filters that you can come across uh, in a photonics lab. In addition to optical properties of uh, optical materials, there's also other non-optical properties that have to be taken into account. Specifically, we are going to talk first about thermal properties of uh, optical materials. Uh, extreme heat or cold and rapid changes in temperature can cause temporary or permanent changes in the physical characteristics of, uh, of an optical uh, material. So the goal is uh, to select the optical material where these types of changes are reduced to, uh, to the minimum. Why is this important to us? Very often you are going to take uh, a specific type of optical component made out of uh, optical material. Most of the time it's going to be some, some sort of a glass. And uh, in order to establish an optical system, you are going to mount these uh, optical components, be it prisms or, or optical windows or, or, or les lenses or mirrors. Uh, made out of uh, glass, you're going to uh, mount them into some sort of uh, some sort of uh, optical mount that is going to be made out of metal. So that's a, a specific example where thermal properties of uh, both materials with uh, with uh, start playing an important role. Uh, why? Because uh, the thermal expansion of a glass and thermal expansion of metal are not going to be the same. So if you're uh, optical system, if your optical component in the system is exposed to uh, variations in the temperature, those variations in temperature may uh, result, may cause uh, uh, thermal expansion of uh, glass and the metal at different rates, which uh, in turn is going to result in a specific uh, amount of stress on the optical elements that can be serious to the point where uh, the optical, optical component can even break. So once more, if a lens is held in the metallic mount, uh, the combination is subjected to a high temperature, the primary heat loss that's going to be experienced by the lens will be through its edges and onto the mount. This will make the window hotter at the center and cooler at the edges. And not only that you're introducing the stress, uh, this uh, condition can also create a certain distortion in optical properties of the optical material that can, you know, can significantly have an uh, impact on, uh, on the performance of your optical system. Uh, the table on the uh, right hand side shows thermal properties of some of the typical materials that we are coming across uh, in, a, in a photonics lab. You can see a few different types of, uh, of uh, metals such as copper, silver and steel. And then down on the bottom you have different crystals and glasses uh, that would be different types of uh, transparent materials that uh, optical components are made out of. Uh, there's a few things that you can immediately uh, observe. You can see that, for example, the thermal conductivity of metals is significantly larger than the thermal conductivity of, of, uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, glass-based types of uh, materials. In other words, the, if uh, these materials are heated, the heat's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be much easier to take, uh, to, to take the heat away from the metals as opposed to the glasses uh, that's, that are going to get hotter. Also, the last column in the table uh, shows the, uh, the, the, the amount of thermal expansion of each of these materials. And you can see that the metals are expanding at a, a much larger rates uh, than most of the crystals and glasses. Uh, so if uh, metals are, if, if both metals and, uh, and uh, transparent materials are exposed to the uh, temperature variations, you're going to see a significant thermal expansion of the metals, which may, uh, as we already elaborated, which may, which may cause uh, the stress uh, on the joints between the metal and the glass. There are certain ways how you can uh, quantify uh, the stress that's caused through the thermal expansion. Uh, so here's uh, an example of, uh, of an equation that can be used. So if you want to, uh, if we want to uh, figure out the stress. Uh, that stress uh, can be uh, can be um, quantified through a certain relationship uh, between the thickness of the optical component, uh, the diameter of the of the uh, of the component, uh, pressure difference between the sides of the of the optical component, uh, elasticity of the material, etc. So we are not going to go much in detail about uh, about. Uh, implementing the formula that you're seeing here. This formula, this equation is just given for reference to uh, show you that you can use certain concepts uh, from a, a thermodynamic uh, to, uh, to quantify the amount of, uh, of stress that can be uh, induced in the case of uh, significant uh, uh, thermal variations on uh, uh, materials with different uh, uh, coefficients of uh, expansion. In addition to thermal properties, uh, chemical properties of optical materials can also uh, uh, affect the performance of your optical system and would have to be uh, paid uh, close attention. So we're talking about the chemical damage to optical element that can be caused by um, uh, different uh, chemicals uh, or chemical ability to etch or dissolve on a, on a transparent medium. So examples of some of such damage can be uh, the effects of uh, acetone or plastics, as well as the effects of water vapor on uh, ionic crystal windows, such as uh, uh, such as uh, uh, different types of uh, salt. So this is another important aspect to be ha that has to be taken into account if you're working in a photonic lab. Uh, based on the experiments that you are performing. So if you are uh, using certain, uh, uh, certain uh, chemicals for different experimentations, you have to uh, pay a close attention what is going to be the effect of those chemicals on, a, on a different uh, optical windows, prisms, lenses, and, uh, and other, other materials that, uh, that, uh, that you may be using in your optical lab. Everything what we talked about so far about optical materials and uh, optical components uh, is going to have an, a significant impact on your decision or on uh, if you are uh, if you are tasked to uh, select uh, specific optical components for your optical system. So as a photonics technician, very often you will be tasked with a task of uh, establishing a specific optical system that is going to also uh, involve. Uh, selection and the order of different types of uh, optical components. So uh, the prior knowledge of the concepts uh, that we are that we are uh, introducing in this uh, and the previous lecture uh, is going to play uh, an important role in uh, the success of, uh, of your of, 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 of you know how you're executing that task of uh, selection and, uh, and the order of optical components. So uh, again to uh, wrap up, to summarize, when you are selecting an optical component, you have to pay a close attention to the optical properties of the of the materials that your components are going to be made out of, and not only optical properties but also thermal properties, chemical properties, and finally also the cost. Right. So very often you are going to be dealing with a limited budget, so you have to make a, a good decision as far as the uh, quality of the optical components that you are ordering, and as well as the pricing. Uh, of, uh, of uh, these components. So uh, the cost of optical components is going to depend on many factors that you have to take into account. For example, if you're looking at the glass and fused quartz, 
those types of uh, components are uh, comparatively expensive because these materials have to be uh, uh, ground and polished and then tested and maintained for a correct flatness or uh, curvature. So in this case, you know, if you are, if you are ordering glass or fused quartz type of uh, optical components, those would be the most expensive. You also have some cheaper alternatives such as plastic optics uh, because in uh, the case of a plastic optics, you don't have to uh, do the polishing, but rather you can make them, you know, using the, the molding processes. Uh, also, if you're looking at optical elements that are made out of crystals, they are also expensive because these crystals have to be grown in a large size with expensive equipment. So pretty much, you know, the type of process that's being used to manufacture a specific type of a material or a component is going to play an important role in a, in a, in the, in the, in the cost of, uh, of those components. So uh, knowing a little bit about different materials and uh, you know how a specific type of optical component is being made uh, would definitely not hurt and uh, it's going to help you uh, make a sound decision about uh, about a specific optical component that you're going to be buying for your photonics lab. Uh, we also have to keep in mind that most of these optical components would have a specific type of uh, coding uh, that's going to be placed on an optical component for different reasons, uh, such as anti-reflective coatings, anti-transmission coatings, etc. And uh, all those processes of applying the coating uh, would uh, also increase the cost of these elements considerably. So to summarize, the manufacturing cost of an optical element, element depends on many factors, uh, size of the component, uh, type of a material that you're going, that, that's being used, Surface curvature of the element, it's easier to uh, obviously make a flat component than, than if you have to make some sort of curved component such as lens. Accuracy of the flatness of the curvature is going to play an important role. Of course, it depends on the optical system that you're building, you know, how, how the accuracy of the flatness uh, or curvature is, uh, is important, is crucial for the performance of your optical system. You also have to take into account the wavelength of the light to be transmitted, different materials, would be reacting to different types of uh, wavelengths in a different way and finally the types of coatings on the surface and finally the the aberrations that may uh, be uh, on the on the uh, on the optical component that uh, would have to be corrected so all these different factors are going to play an important role in uh, establishing the cost of the optical component and uh, how much you're going to pay for them uh, so as a photonics technician, you have to know all these different aspects to a certain extent to be able to make a sound decision during the select, 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 selection process of the components for the optical system that you're building. So what you're seeing on this slide are different types of uh, uh, optical components that you may come across in a photonics lab. Most of them, if not all, are made out of uh, transparent materials. Uh, the glass, the fused quartz, uh, plastic, uh, plastic uh, optics, and uh, the shape would uh, determine a type of the optical component. So you may come across the front surface mirrors, you may come across filters, lenses, prisms, etc. Uh, many of these components are also going to have a specific type of optical coding. You can see that uh, certain surfaces of these components are shown here in different colors and those colors are actually representing the optical coding that has been placed on a on a on an optical component so we are talking about materials of a specific thickness and composition that are deposited through a certain process on the surface of the optical components to control the amount of light that's passing through them so these optical coatings uh, have a very 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 uh, uh, tightly controlled uh, thickness through uh, specific processes because the thickness of the optical coding is going to affect how how that optical component is going to uh, be performing in the optical system. Uh, in other words, you know, how it is going to control the, uh, the reflection and the transmission of the light as, a, as the light is being passed through that optical coding. This slide gives you a brief insight into the two distinct processes that are being used in, uh, in, uh, in photonics to uh, deposit or to apply uh, an optical coding onto an optical component. So those two processes are evaporation and sputtering. In the case of evaporation, the material that's to be to deposited is converted into a vapor using a thermal or electronic beam, and then that vapor is going to be depositing itself onto the optical material surface, sub substrate. So there has to be some sort of a, a control mechanism uh, as far as the duration of the whole deposition. 
uh, because the you know the longer you you uh, uh, continue with this process, the thickness of the uh, of the optical cordon is going to uh, increase. Uh, so there has to be some sort of dy dynamic uh, control or measurement of the thickness that is going to uh, stop uh, the whole process when. Uh, when uh, the, the optical coding uh, achieves the, uh, the desired thickness. Uh, the second process is so-called sputtering. In this case, we are talking about uh, uh, the use of a high voltage that creates a heavy ions of plasma, and that plasma is going to bombard uh, so-called target and knock out small particles of the target that are then going to be uh, condensed on a cooled uh, substrate. So the optical coding is a material that has been knocked out of the target uh, placed in a, in a sputterer. And then, as I said, uh, heavy ions of plasma are going to be hitting that uh, target and, uh, and knocking out small particles of the material that is going to be uh, then uh, applied uh, in the form of, uh, of a coating on the optical component. Both of these processes are being used in, uh, in optics uh, to create optical coatings. And in addition to the process of, uh, of uh, application, you also, as I mentioned, uh, have to have some sort of a, a thickness control uh, in a, in a, in a uh, dynamic means where the thickness of the, of the, of the layer of coating that's being uh, deposited through these two processes is going to be controlled during the, the actual process of uh, application. Uh, uh, and uh, when the, the thickness of the coating, uh, as I said, achieves uh, uh, a, a desired uh, value, uh, the whole process would have to uh, stop. As we already mentioned, the thickness uh, control of the optical coating is extremely important because the thickness of the uh, coating is going to affect its optical properties. Uh, so during the process of uh, optical coating application, you have to have some sort of uh, way of monitoring the thickness uh, while the uh, optical component is in the chamber. There's two uh, distinct ways uh, how is this being achieved. The first one is the use of so-called crystal oscillators. These crystal oscillators are based on a quartz crystal plates that are placed in the same plane as the substrate to be coded. It turns out that the resonant frequency uh, of oscillation of uh, such, an, such a, an oscillator is going to depend on the mass of the crystal. So as uh, you are applying the coding onto the optical uh, component, its mass is going to increase and uh, uh, that increase is going to result in a change of the resonant frequency of the, of the crystal oscillator. And that's going to be the mechanism how you are controlling, how you're controlling the thickness of the, uh, of the optical component, of the, of the optical coding. Another uh, way is uh, the use of so-called interference effects. So uh, we are uh, observing uh, interference effects uh, through a transmitted or reflected optical uh, beam and the transmittance obviously is going to uh, change as the thickness of the coding layer is building up and that is going to establish the mechanism of how we are going to be controlling the thickness of the optical coding. Now that we introduced uh, the process uh, of uh, the optical uh, coding application and the way how it's being controlled, let's talk about a, a few different types of optical codings that you may come across uh, uh, in a uh, in, a, in a world of uh, optics. The first one is so-called anti-reflection coding. Uh, this is a very popular type of a coding, very often is being put on a, on a, on a glasses, uh, as you can see on a right-hand side. So what we're trying to uh, achieve here is uh, a, a reduction of the reflection. So when the light hits this transparent optical medium that's made out of glass, uh, as we already explained in the previous lecture, there's going to be the certain amount of uh, reflection off of the uh, off of the surface of the of the glass, uh, based on the index indices of reflection of the medium that's surrounding the glass, and then in the uh, index of refraction of uh, of, uh, of uh, glass itself. So the way how uh, the coding is gonna uh, reduce the reflection is a uh, is a very creative way. So if you're looking at uh, uh, what's shown here on the left hand side, you can see here basically three layers. Uh, the first layer is the air, and then you have a dielectric code. And down on the bottom you have a you have a glass. So um, what's being shown here again is a is a complete structure that consists of the glass and then anti-reflective coding and finally the, the the surrounding medium. So as the incident light is coming from the uh, from the from the first medium in this case uh, air, 
there's going to be a certain amount of reflection on, uh, on the first frontal surface that's shown here as a reflected beam number one. And then uh, most of the, of the light is going to enter into the coding. And we can see that uh, that uh, transmitted uh, light that's, that entered the coding is going to be reflected again from the, from the next surface between the, between the coding and the glass. And so that reflection is going to come back and a certain amount of it is going to pass uh, 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 back into the, into the air. So we are going to uh, end up with two with two uh, reflected beams, the reflected beam one, or so-called primary reflected beam, and then reflected beam number two, or secondary reflected beam, that uh, has been produced through the to the reflection between the optical coating and the uh, and the glass. So these two reflected uh, beams are going to uh, interfere, and we're going to talk about that in a in a lectures that uh, uh, follow this one. Uh, there's going to be certain, as I said, interference where these two guys will either be adding up or canceling out based on, based on their phase, and this so-called phase is going to be controlled by the thickness of the of the of the of the optical coating. So the phase of the two reflected beams depends on uh, on their relative uh, uh, path lengths. We can see that the path length of the reflected beam one is uh, significantly different. Than the path of the reflected beam number two because reflected beam number two uh, had this extra uh, route to uh, to go through, uh, which is equal to the uh, approximately twice the length of the of the of the optical coating. So the, uh, the path lengths are different, the phases are different, and if these phases are so adjusted for these two uh, uh, reflected beams to cancel out. Uh, in such a case, we have uh, we have uh, achieved a significant re reduction of the ref reflection, or maybe to better use the term instead of using the term uh, reduction, better to use the term uh, of uh, of uh, cancellation of the reflections, uh, so the ref the reflection uh, does not that, uh, that doesn't uh, looks like it does not does not occur. So the the, the effect can be seen on a, on a picture on the right hand side. We can see that. The, uh, the gla glasses on a, on a picture on the left side uh, don't have optical coating, so we see a significant reflection off of the surface of the, of the glass as opposed to the, to the, to the optical glasses on a, on a picture on the right-hand side where there is no reflection or the reflection is, uh, has been uh, significantly uh, reduced through the process of, uh, of uh, anti-reflection coating application. Obviously, the thickness of the of the of the uh, optical coating is going to play an important role as far as uh, how uh, the reflection uh, is going to be, uh, uh, what kind of interference is going to happen between the reflected waves. So there are certain formulas that can be used to uh, calculate the thickness of the optical coating that's going to produce anti-reflective uh, properties. Specifically, on this slide, you can see. Uh, the whole concept being uh, further expanded upon. So we are talking about, again, two uh, reflected beams, beam number one and beam number two, uh, that uh, have a total uh, of 180 degree phase uh, difference that is going to, uh, that is going to uh, enable so-called destructive interference or cancellation of these two reflected beams. Uh, there are certain formulas that can be used to uh, calculate the thickness of this coating that is going to uh, result in a 180 degree phase difference between uh, the, the two uh, phases of these two reflected beams. And if you uh, do the proper math, you come, you're coming up with a formula shown here on the right hand side that, is, uh, gonna, that can be used as a, uh, as a, as a direction uh, in terms of uh, what kind of thickness would have to be uh, selected for uh, for an, uh, an optical coating uh, to uh, produce anti-reflective properties at, at a specific sing sing single uh, wavelength of light lambda. Another popular type of uh, uh, coating is a so-called high reflection coating. So uh, this type of a coating has found uh, many applications. This slide here shows a specific uh, type of application, for example, in the warmer regions of the country where you want to have a good control of uh, air conditioning you don't want the solar uh, energy uh, to uh, to uh, heat the, the interior uh, uh, spaces of uh, of, uh, of uh, apartments or houses 
So you want to uh, put a specific type of a coding on the front frontal surface of uh, of the windows that is going to uh, enable a, a, a huge reflection of the of the of the light that is coming from the sun. Uh, so in such a case, you want to uh, uh, create the uh, so-called high reflection type of a coding that is going to uh, greatly increase the reflection. The way how uh, this type of a coding works is uh, very similar uh, to the previous anti-reflection coding. It's just that here the, the condition is uh, different. So here we would want to uh, establish uh, or uh, achieve the thickness of the uh, coding that is going to uh, enable the two reflective beams, if you remember our beam one and then beam, beam number two, you want these two beams this time uh, to uh, interfere constructively or you want them to, uh, to add up. So here very often uh, uh, multiple layers of dielectric or metallic coatings are being placed on a glass or a suitable surface. You're going to see this type of, uh, of, uh, of application also very often in, a, in, a, in a lasers because every laser has a cavity uh, that uh, uh, ends with uh, two mirrors on each side and those two mirrors have to have a very very good reflective properties uh, uh, and the way how that's being achieved is by uh, creating multiple la layers of uh, coding that is gonna uh, uh, result in a in, in a very very fresh efficient type of a, of a reflection uh, so these codings can be designed uh, for uh, very high reflectance or partial reflectance it can be a function of of uh, wavelengths uh, and in the case of uh, uh, high reflection coatings the thickness of the coating is uh, as i said uh, adjusted to give constructive interference between the reflected rays of light high reflectivity can be achieved only in a narrow wavelength region and also depends on the angle of incidence this is important as i said in the case of lasers because uh, lasers are uh, devices that are operating at a single wavelength so uh, using a specific type of a coding is going to enable uh, the reflection of that specific wavelength while other wavelengths are going to be uh, passed through the through the mirrors as they are not playing an important role in the performance of a, of a, of a, of a laser system what you see on the right hand side are properties of uh, uh, different types of uh, materials based on the thickness of the layers that are that have been applied and you can see here that that specific wavelength uh, lambda sub zero yeah, the reflectance is uh, gonna increase if you add more layers so if you have applied just the two layers the reflectance is around 99 percent and you can make it more efficient you can make it more reflective by adding four or even five layers where reflect reflectance goes from a uh, uh, 99 percent to almost to almost 100 percent every photonic slab has a uh, uh, plenty of mirrors uh, in the case of uh, mirrors we are using metallic coatings so we are putting uh, we are depositing a certain uh, uh, coating that's made out of a of a metal so uh, in this case we are talking about highly reflective broadband specular types of reflections as opposed to the uh, to the to the uh, optical uh, coatings made out of a uh, non-metallic uh, materials uh, where the reflection is uh, focused uh, on a specific single wavelength here we can produce the reflections at, at a, a large uh, a range of, of different wavelengths and you can see here different types of metals that are being used to produce metallic coatings aluminum gold and uh, it's uh, very important to mention that these metals are sensitive to corrosion and therefore uh, must be protected by an additional protective dielectric coating uh, uh, those uh, nuances are uh, addressed in some way during the uh, production of the mirrors at the, at the facilities that are making that are making mirrors there's a few things that you would want to um, uh, pay clo close attention to you can see that for example aluminum has a relatively uh, uh, good properties in terms of reflectance over the entire over the entire uh, ultraviolet and visible uh, and even infrared range that uh, uh, is uh, about 90 percent as opposed to for example gold where you can see that the reflectance or gold is good in infrared region about 700 nanometers while as you are moving into the visible region gold uh, re reflectance of gold is kind of dropping down to almost to almost 40 percent at a at a, at a at a color of a violet of uh, four, uh, 400 nanometers Let's slightly change the subject here. Uh, after we talked about the uh, coatings, we also want to introduce the optical filters. Optical filters are also components that uh, uh, are very frequently used in uh, uh, photonic slabs. 
you may come across many different types of uh, filters and uh, here the classification is being presented so you may come across uh, so-called broadband filters narrow band filters uh, ND or neutral density filters, stepped filters, radiometric, photometric filters, polarizing filters, and also certain uh, uh, special application filters. So uh, in, a, in the following slides, we are going to uh, talk about some of uh, the most popular some of the most popular filters from this uh, from this list. So the first type of uh, filter that we're going to talk about are so-called broadband filters. So here we are talking about the filters that can transmit a certain band of wavelengths of light while blocking all other wavelengths outside of this band. So a typical curve, performance curve of this type of broadband filter is shown here on this slide. So you can see uh, a bell-shaped type of a curve. So uh, what this uh, bell-shaped or Gaussian type of a curve represents is basically what kind of wavelengths are being passed uh, to uh, this type of a broadband filter. So at the peak of the bell-shaped curve is the, your central wavelength. That's where you have the most of transmittance. So if you select that wavelength, uh, most of the light uh, at that wavelength is going to be transmitted to this type of uh, filter. As you're moving away from the central wavelength, you still have a certain range of uh, wave wavelengths at, uh, around that central wavelength where transmittance is relatively uh, high. The way how you are establishing so-called bandwidth of, uh, of a, a broadband filter is you're basically looking at the entire range of the wavelengths where uh, the transmittance of, uh, of a specific wavelength is above 50% of the transmittance of the of the peak. So, for example, if uh, the peak has uh, a transmittance of, let's say, 94%, you're going to be looking at 50% uh, of 94, which uh, in our case is going to be 47. So at 47, uh, you're going to look at the two wavelengths where uh, where uh, the, the, the transmittance is going to be dropped down to 47 and you're going to establish the, the lower and then higher end of your pass band and that's going to define the bandwidth of, of the broadband filter. Another type of filter to mention are so-called cutoff filters. So these filters would allow radiation up to a specific wavelength to pass uh, while uh, um, cutting all other remaining wavelengths. So for this specific type of uh, uh, curve that you're seeing here, you can see that transmittance is very high, is above 90% for all the wavelengths above about 650 nanometers. So this kind of filter is going to be passing almost the entire infrared range uh, while cutting uh, all the wavelengths uh, below 650 nanometers into the visible range and further, further into the ultraviolet range. We're going to find many applications of these types of filters, for example, you're, if you're dealing with uh, uh, with a specific type of a laser, you uh, want to uh, address the safety concerns. Uh, that laser is going to have a certain harmful radiation uh, uh, at uh, certain uh, wavelengths. So you would have to use a specific type of a filter to cut off those those wavelengths so that you don't uh, uh, harm the, uh, the eye of the photonics technician that is working with that type of a laser. So specifically here. Uh, uh, frequency double the uh, YAG laser is mentioned that has output of 532 nanometers and then also a harmful, harmful infrared uh, radiation at 10, uh, uh, 60 nanometers so very often we would want to, uh, to cut, cut some of these uh, some of these wavelengths in order to, uh, uh, to um, uh, block any kind of potential damage to uh, either, uh, either uh, uh, optical system or uh, to uh, reduce the risk of any kind of uh, hazard uh, to the to the to the uh, people who are working in the photonics lab, neutral density filters filters are the filters that are not wavelength sensitive; they're intensity sensitive. So we can see on the curves on the right hand side that uh, uh, the performance of these filters is relatively flat over the entire range of wavelengths, and uh, these filters are also going to be very 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 uh, 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 frequently used in an optical lab. So, for example, you may have a certain equipment, certain uh, measurement equipment that is uh, sensitive to the to the irradiance or the power of the light that uh, is uh, 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 entering uh, uh, their detectors. So, you would want to put this type of a filter to uh, reduce the intensity of light so that uh, it becomes uh, non-harmful to uh, to the detectors that are be being used in these in these uh, measuring devices. Uh, you can see that uh, according to the uh, 
to the to the label. We may you may have ND30, 20, 10, or five, uh, and many others. And uh, each of these different labels would uh, correspond to a specific amount of uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of transmittance through uh, that type of uh, uh, neutral density filter. Uh, the, uh, the type of the, of the filter depends also on something called optical density uh, or uh, so-called number OD and we can see that uh, the OD uh, as shown on a, on a plot on the right hand side for different types of uh, uh, neutral density filter can be translated into a specific amount of transmittance using the formula shown in the equation on, a, on, the, uh, on the left hand side. So for example if you are considering the, the uh, neutral density filter ND20, you can see that uh, uh, ND20 would have an optical density of about 2, right? So ND20 has an optical density of about 2. So if you take the, o the uh, OD equal to 2 and you uh, substitute in the, in the formula on the, right, the left-hand side, you're going to have 10 to the negative 2, which is uh, equal to 0.01 or 1%, in other words, that type of a filter is going to be passing only 1% of the, of the incident light. So the ND20 uh, filter is going to be passing only 1% of the, of the incident light while blocking uh, the, the, uh, the rest of 99% of that light. So that's how you can, you can try to translate a specific label uh, of the, or a type of a neutral density filter based on the curves that you see on the right hand side into specific amount of uh, transmittance. Let's mention a few other types of uh, filters. Narrow band filter uh, is a type of filter that's going to pass the light only at a specific wavelength uh, while the rest of the spectrum is going to get uh, reflected. Uh, so it's kind of like very similar to, uh, to a broadband filter, it's just that in this case the, the, the whole bandwidth is a, is a very, very, very uh, uh, reduced to a minimum, almost like a single wavelength is being passed through this type of a filter. Radiometric filters are the filters that are going to transmit light equally at all wavelengths. They have found uh, different applications, uh, such as in the case of a light detectors that uh, often do not have a flat response to all the wavelengths of light, and these filters are going to be used to uh, to uh, establish that kind of balance so that, so that uh, the light detector reacts to, uh, to uh, the entire range of uh, wavelengths of interest in, a, in the same way. Photometric filters are the filters that are transmitting maximum light at 550 nanometers and then fall steeply on each side. And this type of photometric filters are basically a replica of the performance of a human eye. So you can see the two curves on the left-hand side, one that represents the, 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 the filtering properties of a human eye, another one that represents the, the uh, filtering properties of a photo cell with a photometric filter. So there are certain applications where you want to, uh, where you want to uh, replicate the filtering properties of the, of the human eye, and that's where the photometric filters are going to find their use. And finally, at the end, since we are talking about the filters, we cannot uh, avoid the subject of uh, protective eyewear. This is an important subject that is going to be addressed in a separate lecture at the end of this, uh, of this uh, course. We are going to uh, soon talk about the human eye and its sensitivity to, uh, uh, to the light, especially to uh, a stronger uh, power of the light beams. So uh, but before we talk about that, we're going to just um, introduce the concept of the laser safety and uh, safety in a photonics lab. We are going to see that uh, certain lasers uh, with the powers above certain thresholds and the certain durations of uh, exposure will be having a uh, hazardous effect, harmful effect to, uh, to the human eye. So as a photonics technician, you would, you would need to know uh, how to properly select a pro protective uh, safety eyewear in a photonics lab. So uh, uh, again, laser safety is a very important factor in a laser laboratory, and this, pr this protective eyewear is nothing else than a specific type of, uh, of a filter that is uh, blocking uh, light at specific wavelengths or by, while passing the light at, uh, at other wavelengths. So uh, if you're looking at a uh, human body uh, with various organs, it turns out that the eye is the most vulnerable to the laser radiation. Uh, because uh, if the reflected laser beam or incident laser beam is focused on a, on a retina uh, uh, of the eye, it can result in a significant damage that may be uh, severe and irreparable. Uh, 
uh, and uh, in order for that to avoid, you have to use specific type of a protective eyewear, uh, specific type of safety goggles that uh, uh, would have a specific types of uh, properties and uh, specific type of uh, filtering characteristics. So you can see here uh, one type of laser protective uh, eyewear and then also curve that uh, uh, presents the transmittance uh, through uh, this type of laser safety eyewear. You can see here that uh, this type of um, laser safety eyewear is going to have a good, uh, good blocking characteristics at the, at the wavelengths of uh, 430 and below. Uh, so this type of laser safety uh, eyewear is going to be used for uh, for that range for the ultraviolet range, uh, while at the same time is passing the visible range. So if you if you are dealing with a, for example with an ultraviolet laser or UV laser, uh, you want to protect your eyes from uh, from that UV radiation that's coming off of the UV laser. And this type of uh, uh, laser safety eyewear with this type of uh, uh, filtering uh, curve may be a good fit for for that type of uh, for that type of purpose or for that type of application. To conclude the lecture number five of our uh, video series, in this lecture we started uh, uh, considering certain practical aspects of, uh, of a photonics lab uh, after we introduced light and the important quantities that describes the light in the uh, first three lectures uh, and uh, after we laid out the foundation of photonics we, uh, and after we talked about the terminology of light, uh, the nature of light, uh, its interaction with the media. Uh, in uh, this lecture we are slowly moving into the photonics lab and we are trying to see uh, how uh, all those basic foundations of uh, how the light interacts with the media can be translated into its use in a, uh, in a photonics lab. So we started talking about uh, optical materials, optical components, coatings, uh, filters. Uh, uh, so these uh, types of uh, components are going to be frequently used in a photonics lab. So you're going to be frequently using them as a photonics technician. So it's important to understand uh, the, the, the background behind uh, their operation. Uh, next time in the lecture six, we are going to be talking about optical amounts, which is also going to be an important uh, important uh, uh, subject uh, that you should be aware as a photonics technician. So here I'm going to conclude lecture number five. I wish you the uh, pleasant rest of the day and I'll see you next time.